Hello everyone, we've got a shootout today. We got the Super Retro Trio versus the Retron 5. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's unbox these already and get started. The Super Retro Trio is made by Retrobit, and I have a little bit of experience with them because I bought their Retro Duo, and I had purchased it because at the time it was the best thing on the market. This thing was playing games like Star Fox back when no other clone console could, and the Super Retro Trio is a follow-up to that. The box tells you that it cannot support Game Boy Advance without a special adapter, and it also doesn't support Game Boy without the Super Game Boy attachment. But really, if you have a Game Boy collection, you need to own a Super Game Boy. It's blasphemy if you don't. They used to put people in the stocks for lesser offenses in the Middle Ages. What the Super Retro Trio does support out of the box, though, is original NES, Super NES, Super Famicom, Genesis, and Mega Drive. It comes with two Super NES-style controllers, and they go to a Genesis-style plug, which is really strange. You use a switch on the top of the console to change which port you're playing games from, and there's a cover on the front for the controller ports and also the region switches. But it's really strange because I tried a lot of Japanese games and at least one PAL game, and I never had to move that switch. At least on the front of the console, the plastic seems to have a little bit of a build quality issue. Otherwise though, I have to say this is a damn good looking console. Now when it was first announced, it looked really good. It had this gunmetal black finish, and the other parts of the console had this shiny orange-red amber mix that looked really, really good. Unfortunately though, someone at the factory must have pushed the wrong button because those colored bits came back with the same color as a laundry detergent bottle. I think that one looks hideous and that's why I went for the silver and black model. The Retron 5 is made by a company called Hyperkin. They have a stupidly shaped box which is only matched by a stupidly shaped controller. And behold, this is the last time you're ever going to see this thing nice and shiny. The black plastic part on top picks up every speck of dust within a 5 mile radius. And when I'm taking out of its plastic, you can see that it already has some scratches on it. Just like the Super Retro Trio, you can also use your original controllers, and they have Player 1 on one side, Player 2 on the other side. The Retron 5 can emulate all the systems that the Super Retro Trio does, but it also adds support for Famicom, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy. Unlike the Super Retro Trio, which goes the route of traditional clone systems, the Retron 5 uses an Android operating system, and the back of the box says that they're shooting for 100% compatibility. Let's see how far they got. The biggest difference after unboxing them is definitely the controllers. The Retron 5's controller is terrible. The buttons don't have a lot of travel and they're very clicky. The best way I could describe it is that it's kind of like the buttons that you get on a computer mouse. The clicks are also very loud and the D-pad clicks when you move it as well. One of the strange things is that when you turn it over, you can clearly see that they almost gave this a battery compartment. The controls are not bad, they do work, but the feeling that they could have been better is unavoidable. Think about it this way, your TV remote has better buttons than a Retron 5. The Super Retro Trio's controller doesn't look impressive, but believe it or not, it is. You see, I've owned a lot of Super NES clone controllers, including the ones that came with the Retro Duo, and they always get it wrong. The D-pad is too thick, the buttons sit too high, and the plastic feels like something that came out of a Happy Meal. So it's amazing that this time around, they actually made a one-to-one -one clone of the Super NES controller. I kid you not, if you blindfolded somebody and put this controller in one hand and a real Super NES controller in the other, they would have a hard time telling the difference. The fact that the Super Retro Trio clones the Super NES controller sparks an argument that I hear every time these consoles are brought up. Diehard retro gamers always ask, why don't you just play these games on their original systems? But the fact of the matter is that a lot of these consoles are no longer affordable, easy to find, or repairable for a lot of people out there. And a lot of people who bring up that argument like to think that their consoles are the most reliable things on the planet. Face the facts, these are Japanese electronics that are so old you could buy them a beer. Talk to any retro gamer who's been in the scene for a while, and he will tell you that every one of these consoles has its own faults and weaknesses. Another huge difference is that the Retron 5 outputs HDMI and the Super Retro Trio outputs composite. And actually, the Retron 5 was supposed to put out composite, but it was deleted somewhere in development. That becomes a huge problem when we're comparing these consoles. The Super Retro Trio signal is analog, and the Retron 5's is digital. What you're watching on your screen right now is a digital signal, and what shows up on a CRT television is an analog signal. Since the Retron 5 signal is digital, that makes it very easy for me to show you what it looks like. But since the Super Retro Trio signal is analog, it looks great on a CRT television, but it's almost impossible for me to show you what that looks like here. Of course the Retron 5 can also do some other tricks like adding a filter to the image, and filters like HQ2X look pretty good. 
I guess it's a new way to enjoy your old games, kind of like a remaster. But personally, I'm a fan of pixel art, so I usually take off the filters. That way I can enjoy the pixels as crisp and accurately as possible. I like my pixels like I like my women. Big and beautiful. Scan lines are very popular these days, but I think they look like crap. They drive me crazy because they're very noticeable when you turn them on. It looks like those lines that appear on flip animation cards. I can't avoid looking at them and it's very distracting. Again, I just think it's very ugly. And of course, the Super Retro Trio can't do any of these tricks, all it can output is nostalgia. I understand that a lot of people want the Retron 5 because it has native HDMI output, and of course we're all using HD TVs these days. But I don't mind hooking up my old CRT television, but maybe that's because I own a Samsung GX gaming TV. Oh yeah. Sorry Retron 5, you're not invited to this party. Alright, let's test some games already. Now please note, I do have a pretty diverse collection, but it's by no means complete. So if you're expecting me to test a super rare game like Action 52 or something, it's not going to happen here. But I will post a list in the description showing all the games I tested. I decided to start with 16-bit emulation. After all, mo bits, mo problems, right? But amazingly, both consoles were 100% compatible with my collection. Now again, that was just with my collection though. I don't have any homebrew games to test, but I've been told they will not work on the Retron 5. The Retron 5 is a lot more touchy. The games have to load onto the system, and some of them put up a bigger fight than others. The Retron 5 is also a lot more grabby with your cartridges. I tested out my whole collection on both of these consoles, and they have loosened up a little bit over time, but the Retron 5 still seems to have this problem, especially with the Genesis cartridge port. But when the Retron 5 is working, it looks good. Come on, come on, come on! Wait, wait, what? What the hell? Cartridge power fault? The fuck does that mean? And just to let you know, I played Super Metroid from beginning to end on the Super Retro Trio and I didn't have a single hiccup the whole way through, so it was not a problem with my cartridge. There are some hidden benefits to the Retron 5. One of the things I didn't realize is that it works as a translator. It translates game titles verbatim. Anyone up for a game of Yossi Island? Or how about The Legend of Zelda, The Triforce of the Gods? It also translated some games that I didn't know the title to, like for instance Mahujin Guru Guru 2. I've always wanted to play this game because it looks really good. And especially after I found out that you can use IPS translation patches. Unfortunately though, I found out that this is one of the few Enix JRPGs that remains untranslated. I then tried to apply a translation patch to Nanoku Shuonen whatever, but it ended up not working. So just as a warning to you guys, don't buy Japanese games expecting that the patches are going to work or that they're even going to be available. Do your homework before you buy. Another advantage of the Restaurant 5 is that you can use safe states and cheat codes. It's really amazing how they were able to get cheat codes in there because apparently from what I've heard they bought out Game Genie so that they could use those codes. In all honesty though, I think that those features really diminish the value of playing a game on a cartridge. The Retron 5 can also use the power base converter on the Sega Genesis cartridge port. This allows you to play Sega Master System games. Unfortunately, because of the way that they designed the Super Retro Trio, you cannot use the power base converter. However, the hardware is still there. If you have an EverDrive cartridge, it will play Sega Master System games. Another thing I didn't expect from the Super Retro Trio is that you can actually play Super NES games with a Sega 6 button controller. But just make sure that it has the mode button because that becomes your select. If playing Super NES games with a Genesis controller is wrong, then I don't want to be right. Original NES and Super NES controllers do work on the Super Retro Trio, but they will only work on their respective systems. Also, you can use Super Retro Trio controllers on an Atari. And let me tell you, playing Atari games with a Super NES controller is a religious experience that I hope you can all have one day. Another advantage is that you can play with more than one cartridge inserted at a time, and that's actually a lot more fun than you think. Being able to switch between different consoles with the flip of a switch is a really cool feature. Now let's go to 8-bit emulation. I've always noticed that clone consoles from the past always had a really hard time getting the NES's sound chip right, but I played Mega Man 2 on both consoles and they both seemed just fine. Retron 5 seems to have had some compatibility issues at first. When I initially tried out the system, the Guardian Legend would not work. I tried for at least 10 minutes and it wouldn't work, but it did work on the Super Retro Trio. Then after a 
Chrome War update, it had no problems playing it. I also couldn't get Videomation to work, but I can't hold that against it because it clearly says on the cover that this is not a game. It did work on the Super Retro Trio though. Like I said, the Retron 5 is a little bit more touchy. I also tried on licensed games and had no problems on either console. The Super Retro Trio did have some problems though with Castlevania 3. The poor thing tries so hard to play Castlevania 3. When you turn it on you could hear music but there's no graphics, then it takes you to the title screen, and you can get to the intro but it's all glitched up. And after that it will go no further, it's just a black screen. I was disappointed but not surprised that it didn't play. That's because Castlevania 3 uses the MMC5 chip. That is the largest and most complicated memory management control chip that ever appeared on an NES game, making this one of the hardest NES games to emulate. Uncharted Waters also didn't work for the same reason. Both of these games had no problems running on the Retron 5. And just wait before anybody starts thinking, oh my god, the Super Retro Trio isn't going to be compatible with half of my collection. Don't worry, a whopping four games came over here to the west with that chip. And these are the only two that are worth owning. There are also plenty of other games with special chips, and they play just fine on both consoles. So, it looks like the Retron 5 was heading for 100% compatibility. But wait, we're not letting the Retron 5 off that easily. What if I told you that the Retron 5 has less compatible games than the Super Retro Trio? It's unfortunate, but the Retron 5 made a Faustian bargain by going full HDMI and removing the composite output, because light gun compatibility was sacrificed as a result. The games will load, but it's actually something wrong with flat screen TVs. You can find explanations on the web, but basically flat screen TVs do not refresh fast enough. There are 10 NES games that require a light gun, and you will not be able to play those on the Retron 5. Speaking of which, I also don't have a Menacer or any Genesis light gun games, but regardless of the system, if it's a light gun game, I guarantee you the Retron 5 will not support it. And of course, light gun games will work on the Super Retro Trio. But believe it or not, I found one game that neither the Retron 5 nor the Super Retro Trio could play. And that game is... Eight Eyes. At first I thought the cartridge was bad because it didn't work on either one of them, but then I checked on somebody's Retron 5 compatibility list and sure enough, it doesn't work and it gives the same error. I really don't know why, but it does use a special chip, the MMC3. But it couldn't just be that because other games have the MMC3 chip and I didn't have any problems with those. This game just refuses to be played on a clone system. And not only that, I refuse to play it. It's actually not a very good game anyways. Now let's try out the Famicom emulation. And of course the Retron 5 is able to play Famicom games, but the Super Retro Trio does not. But I expect it might be able to if you use a pin adapter. In fact, the Retron 5's Famicom emulation is just a pin adapter as well. And I can prove it to you. I was able to trick it into playing a bootleg copy of Tailspin, and it shouldn't have been able to because that game was never even released on the Famicom. I believe that Famicom support could have been easily implemented on the Super Retro Trio, but I think I understand their choice to not include it. Because really, who here owns Famicom games? I don't even see them in the retro gaming shops I go to. Plus, there are tons of pitfalls in Famicom collecting since a lot of these games are text-heavy and entirely in Japanese, and don't count on there being a fan translation patch for Famicom games. I do own a few and there are some hidden gems that didn't make it to the West, but for most of the simpler games that don't require fluency in Japanese, those did get poured to the NES, so you're really not missing out on much. I'm willing to bet that the Famicom slot will go unused on the majority of Retron 5s out there. Now let's look at Game Boy Advance. This is another one that the Super Retro Trio doesn't support right out of the box. But according to the manual, if you buy that adapter for it, it does support single cartridge hosting and multi-cart link-up. I chose not to buy that adapter, and I don't plan to for a very good reason. That's because Game Boy Advance games look like crap on anything bigger than a Game Boy Advance screen. They look like low-pixel Super NES games to me, probably because some of them were. I remember back when people were complaining that GBA games looked bad on the DS Lite screen, so why do people suddenly want to play them on a 42-inch screen? It doesn't make any sense. But for those who want to play GBA games, the Retron 5 had no problems with the ones in my collection. Alright, and now is when I'm going to sound like a hypocrite because I love how Game Boy games look on a TV. But I think you could blame that on those Game Boy kiosks and the Super Game Boy. It's disappointing, but the Super Game Boy will not work on the Retron 5. It will recognize it, but it will not detect the game in it. It does work on the Super Retro Trio, and that's how I'm able to test the Game Boy on it. The Retron 5 does add color, but it seems to use the color palette from the Game Boy Player and the Game Boy Advance. Personally, I'm not a fan of it, and I especially hate it on a game like Metroid 2. 
because you see on some of these early games, the color palette does not come from the cartridge, it comes from the Super Game Boy cartridge. And of course that's a problem because the Retron 5 is not on speaking terms with the Super Game Boy. And that makes Samus' ship look like this. Also, Robopon Sun version does not work on the Retron 5, but it does work on the Super Retro Trio. Now, not only is this review a compatibility test, but it's also a long-term test. I've had these consoles pretty much since launch, so I've had them for almost a year, and I want to show you something by using one of my favorite games, Subterranea. This is a really cool game, it's a mix of like Lunar Lander and Choplifter. But anyways, the reason that we're going to use this is because this game demands precise control. In fact, the controls are so good in this game, and <clears throat> I'm so good at this game, that I can run rings around the test area both forwards and backwards. However, I'm not able to do it on the Retron 5. At first I thought it was just a problem with that wonky controller that it came with, but then I plugged in the Super Retro Trio controller into the Retron 5 and I still had the same problem. I did some scientific analysis of the footage. The reason it was so hard to control is because the Retron 5 has lag. When I slowed it down I found out it has about a tenth of a second of lag. Now another thing you have to realize is that flat screen TVs also carry a little bit of lag themselves. So I did the same test with the Super Retro Trio connected and I still had a tiny bit of lag, about half of what I had before. And remember, I tested this with a wired controller. If you're using the Bluetooth controller, I expect that to be even worse. So about half of that lag came from the Retron 5 and the other half came from the TV. Still though, it is lag. And not all flat screen TVs are the same. So if you do this test, you might have less or you might have more. I did the same test with the Super Retro Trio connected to a CRT television and found no lag. But one thing is for sure, the Retron 5 does have lag, and that lag makes a game like Subterranea impossible to play. Now I'll admit this lag is pretty minor. On some games you probably won't even notice it. For instance, if you're playing a turn-based JRPG, you probably aren't going to be affected by it. But if you're playing a game like Mega Man 2, you are going to start missing jumps in certain areas. As I understand it, this delay is the same reason why light gun games will not work. <gasps> it's almost as if the people who designed these games 20 years ago expected them to be played on a CRT television. I also noticed that the Retron 5 has another huge problem that I have to address. It has some serious reliability issues. Sometimes it'll just randomly go to the menu and reset the cartridge. And this happens way too often. And the worst part about that is it will freeze for about 2 seconds before it goes to the menu, and that 2 seconds is enough time for you to say to yourself, Shit, I didn't save my game. It also freezes every now and then. For some reason, the freezing usually occurs right before something big is about to happen. For instance, on Mega Man 2, it froze just before the Woodman boss battle. And like Super Metroid, I played through the entirety of this game on the Super Retro Trio just to prove that there is nothing wrong with my cartridge. For a while, I thought that maybe these problems were happening because I was testing out the filters or the scan lines, but then I was just playing Super Mario Bros. 2 with no filters or anything, and sure enough, it froze and went back to the menu. Another terrible thing is that when it restarts, it's supposed to try to take you back to where you ended your last play session, but when it just restarts out of nowhere, it takes you back to a random area. If you go online, you'll find many stories about people getting consoles that are dead on arrival or died soon after. You'll hear about bent pins and the cartridge ports. I've even heard some people say that the Retron 5 can destroy your cartridge, but to be honest, I'm a little skeptical of that one. And just a few weeks ago when I went to my local retro gaming store, I asked them about the Retron 5 and Super Retro Trio. They actually stocked both systems, and without even telling the clerk that I own both systems, she advised me to stay away from the Retron 5. According to her, half of the Retron 5s they sell come back defective. So guys, I gotta tell you, be careful. It seems that the Retron 5 is having some serious reliability issues. This review is a comparison, so let's go through some of the main points for each console again. The Retron 5 outputs crisp and clean pixels, and it looks great on a flat screen television. The filters improve the look of your old games quite a bit, so it's a new way of enjoying your old games. But as you know, I prefer not to use them. The emulation tools like save states and cheats are very helpful in some games, even though I think it diminishes the experience a little bit. Also, being able to copy from and write save files onto the cartridge is a handy feature. Also, the translation patching ability is really useful if you're into imports. On the bad side, the Retron 5 cannot use the Super Game Boy, and that really does affect me. It also doesn't support light gun games, and because of that, it will never have 100% compatibility. And one of the biggest problems here, it has lag. 
Also, the controller that they include is terrible. It might be the worst controller I have. It also might have issues with IPS patches. I couldn't get mine to work. And by far the biggest issue here is that the Retron 5 has crippling reliability problems. And lastly, I want to point out that the console is pretty expensive. I think the MSRP for it right now is 160 And when we look at the Super Retro Trio, I gotta say, it works, it's very simple, and stupidly reliable. It plays pretty much everything you throw at it. The compatibility list is impressive, and it works with EverDrive. Another big one, the controller is fantastic, and I can see this being very useful for some people out there. Not everyone who's buying these consoles has a retro gaming collection. Some people are just starting to get into it, some people are trying to revisit the games from their childhood. And if that's the case, if you're starting from square one, then this system is very attractive because it comes with the controller that you want for retro gaming. And even better, it comes with two. The Super Retro Trio also works with the Super Game Boy, which makes me very happy. It's also very inexpensive. When I check the prices right now, it goes for about $60. And that is a lot of console for not a lot of money. And lastly, it looks good. I think it definitely is the better looking system here. And when I was looking at prices, I saw that they sell a white and blue one now. That one looks incredible. But of course it has some disadvantages. NES games with the MMC5 chip don't work. It also does not output to HD. But in my opinion, you should be playing this on a CRT television. Go ahead and try it, I guarantee you're going to be impressed. However, it doesn't play Famicom games or Game Boy Advance games without an adapter. And lastly, it doesn't have save states or emulation tools like the Retron 5. So which one do I prefer? Well, obviously I prefer the Super Retro Trio. What it comes down to is just being able to enjoy the games that you have. And the Super Retro Trio is the console you dreamed about in the 90s that was never made until now. Well, almost. I had both of these consoles hooked up in the same room during the long-term test, and when I came home, I always turned on the Super Retro Trio, because I didn't have to worry about the reliability problems of the Retron 5. I thought the simplicity of the Super Retro Trio would be a disadvantage, but it turns out it's better. I've started to wean myself off of emulation, and it makes the games a lot more enjoyable. You actually get better at playing your games, rather than just getting through your games. Emulation tools are big selling points for the Retron 5, but these same tools and the Android operating system cause more problems than they solve. And do you really want these problems infecting your retro games? The Retron 5 tries so hard to be an emulator it forgets to be a console. And that brings us to an even greater and more controversial issue regarding the Retron 5. It has no value. Everyone who bought one got ripped off. You see, there's a reason it feels so much like an emulator. It's because it's running stolen emulation software. Let me explain with a little timeline here. Back in March of 2013 is when they announced the Retron 5, and we were all excited because they had mentioned, you know, save states and cheat features, stuff that emulators have been enjoying for a long time, and it felt like clone systems were finally catching up to PC emulation. But then around June of 2013, it lost its composite output and it was announced it would be running on Android. In hindsight, I think this is the point where the Retron 5 stopped being a game console and just became an Android emulation setup. In the summer of 2014, after several delays, the Retron 5 was finally released. I think some people in the emulation scene were suspicious of the Retron 5 because Hyperkin refused to release the source code. Then on September 19th, LibRetro posted a damning article with evidence showing that the Retron 5 was running open source emulators and were violating GPL licenses in doing so. Let me give you some context. The developers at LibRetro created an open source project called RetroArc that is used to manage emulators for a variety of retro consoles. And RetroArc is available on the Android store for free. I think you can see where this is going, can't you? Now let me tell you, one of the ways in which LibRetro caught Hyperkin with their hand in the cookie jar makes Hyperkin seem so dim-witted, so incompetent, that it begs retelling. One might even call this fuck up a three Stoogian mistake. Are you guys ready for this? Do you really want to know how they got caught? Hyperkin got caught because they shipped out the Retron 5 with pieces of RetroArch source code in the front end menu. Hyperkin, how stupid can you get? Did you think they weren't going to recognize their own work? And even worse, Hyperkin then rushed to make version 2.0 to remove it. That update was published on September 23rd, just four days after LibRetro had published their allegations against Hyperkin. A day after that, on September 24th, Hyperkin finally released their source code. 
In a public statement, they claimed that they always intended to release the relevant source code, and they admitted that they had not been as quick as they could have been. They blamed this delay on being too busy improving the Retron 5 user experience. Yeah, bullshit. The statement also admits that the Retron 5 uses open source emulators. This is a huge problem, because the Genesis and Super NES emulators cannot be commercially distributed. I know this is a lot to take in, so some of you might be confused, but just use common sense. The open source community makes a lot of cool stuff, and because it's open source, it's free and it becomes a great service to everyone. But that doesn't mean you could take it all for yourself, put a price tag on it, and then rake in the cash. When you decide to use any open source projects, you have to follow the rules that go with the license attached to it. Hyperkin chose to ignore those rules, and as the LibRetro article points out, which was actually authored by many of the people who created these emulators, they were not contacted nor asked for permission to use their work. Gee, Hyperkin, I just had a crazy idea! Maybe if you had recruited these people instead of stealing their hard work, your console wouldn't have turned out so fucked up! Hyperkin's greed and selfishness is astounding. This is Bond villain type shit here. You know, like that shitty Bond movie where the villain's trying to steal like a Commodore 64 or something? Joking aside, they took something that was free to everyone, that they didn't create and didn't own, and decided to sell it. It's like putting a barbed wire fence around a public park and charging admission to get in. It's bad enough that they ripped off the hard work of others, but on the consumer level they ripped us off because their console is no better, and usually it's worse, than the exact same thing you could get for free. I assure you, whatever you're watching this on right now, you can install RetroArch on it and get more than what the Retron 5 can give you. There is no value to the Retron 5. You'd be a fool to pay for it. I'm a fool for paying for it. It's a free service to you. That's the point of open source software. And of course Hyperkin concealed this. I'm sure myself and others would have cancelled our pre-orders had we known that the emulators were the same ones being used in RetroArch, and definitely had we known that they were stolen. So you see, hypothetically, even if the Retron 5 didn't have the reliability problems it currently has, or if the Super Retro Trio was a lot worse, I still couldn't recommend the Retron 5. It's a horrible console that shows just how greedy and self-centered a company can get. I was scammed, and I can't even sell the damn thing now because it doesn't work properly. So unfortunately for them, this is the first and the last time I will ever show a Hyperkin product. Hyperkin products are not welcome on this channel. So, those are my thoughts about these two consoles and why I think the Super Retro Trio is the winner here. I expect that some people might criticize my decision to include the whole Lib Retro vs. Hyperkin story in there. They might say that that has nothing to do with the quality or performance of the Retron 5. But I disagree, I say that has everything to do with the low quality and performance that we saw in the Retron 5. The Retron 5 is an obvious get-rich-quick scheme. If they couldn't respect the people who developed those emulators that they use, then how the hell do you expect them to respect you as the consumer? All I could say now is please think before you spend your money, guys. And that's all the time that I have for today. I've got plenty of videos on the way, and I'll see you next time.